Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to Tullinani Castle. My name is Bartle, and I'm going to be your tour guide this afternoon. And I'm just very pleased to say that I still see that Mary Edward is still outselling Jane Austen. Look at the crowd of you that are here. Okay. <laughs> Somebody told me there's only 30 people coming. It's a beautiful day, right? So if you want to bring anybody around, you just bear with us. We, we have the room in all the big rooms to fit everybody in. And then I'll speak like this so that everybody can hear me as well. Okay? So the lady of the house, Valerie Packenham, is just going to come out now very shortly. And Valerie is a, a, an author and she's currently working on a book on Marie Edward too. And she's going to tell you a little bit about the actual Packenham family connection to Marie Edward. Because Maria would be a regular visitor here to the estate. And here we have Valerie here. That's what I just said. <laughs> Letters for a book for the, well, called, we're going to call Letters from Ireland um, for the last six or seven years. So I've really been living with the Edgeworths for a very long time, and um, I can hardly bear to ever think of giving them up again. But anyway, um, I've got a book I hope coming out in October. And I just thought I'd quickly tell you a bit about um, If anyone wants to sit down, this is your only chance because there are sofas here, so <laughs> I, should, I should sit down. Um, anyway, um, I don't know how much you know about the I don't know how well. an expert you all are on the Hedgeworth family and the connection with the family. Um, but as you know, people in the 17th, 18th, and even the 19th century tended to marry their neighbours' daughters, so there was a lot of connections between the Edgeworths and the Packenhams, really from the 17th century on. They were both families of what are called adventurers. They came over in the Elizabethan period and were looking for, obviously, good, cheap land and uh, favours to make their fortunes in Ireland. So, but the, um, I think the Edgeworths were a lot wilder. Uh, is that somebody, is that somebody okay? Uh, anyway, <laughs> anyway, <laughs> I hope I'll have to shout above the prize. Anyway, so the Edgeworths were a much wilder altogether and much more um, exciting family. I don't know if you've read the Black Book of Edgeworth's Town, any of you? Yes. Anyway, anyway as you can see, they were a very, kind of very uh, rackety lot and were frequently eloping and going bankrupt and managing to save themselves by marrying rich wives just in time. Um, and so really the only, the first kind of sober Edgeworth was brought up actually by his uncle, who was a Pakenham. Um, so he was the one there. Do you see there? And that, under the coat of arms there. I think he was, anyway. I can slightly muddled about generations. So, anyway, he was brought up and became, he was the father of Richard Lovell Edgeworth, and he was the, the, the first one who really put the estate together and kind of got out of debt and, um, and brought up his son. Again, gave his son a very good education. So, um, um, and then Richard Lovell Edgeworth really knew three generations of Pakenhams, and would have come here a great deal. He came here as a teenager, and he was cured of two potential vices by the Pakenham relations. I, I thought I'd read you about these first. The first thing was he came, um, let me just see. Anyway, he, was, he, he came, first of all, um, his, his, um, the, the Elizabeth, the, by this time, the Pakenhams were married a, a Longford heir, it's called Elizabeth Cuff. This is about 1740. And she was very um, well read and, and, and sophisticated. And she basically, he, she, she, he came over to see her at Locke and he, she gave him the key to the library. And up to then, apparently, he'd been mad about hunting and shooting. And, um, and, and, but anyway, after he had the key for the library, he became obsessed with reading. So he gave up um, field sports and became a good, serious reader. And he was also taken by. Um, Lord Longford of the day, the, again the first Lord Longford, he was taken, um, he was given some money, they were, they were all playing fair at the evening after dinner. This all comes in Richard Lovell Edgeworth's mm -hmm. memoirs. And, um, and um, anyway, he, Lord Longford, called it, that they have a fairy bank, the principal gentry played with much eagerness at no very low rate. Lord Longford called me aside 
and putting five guineas into my hand, desired me to try my fortune. In the course of the evening, I won what appeared to be a large sum, nearly a hundred guineas. The next evening, he asked whether I would again risk my winning. I readily complied, and when I was reduced to a single guinea, he offered to lend me whatever I wanted. But I declined the offer, rose from the table, and continued to look on during the rest of the evening. The next day, Lord Longford told me he had induced me to play to obtain an insight into my character. I observed, said he, that you were never too eager or too indifferent, that you were not elated when you won, that you kept your temper when a rapid run of ill luck reduced you to poverty. Therefore, I congratulate you on being in all probability exempt from the vice of gambling. So they've been cured of hunting, shooting, and gambling. So, so that's, 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 the, um, that's my, uh, the first Lord Longford, who you'll see the portrait of in the, in the dining room. Now, the next, the next one was um, a, a naval captain. Um, and again, he was a great friend of Richard Lovell Edgeworth. And he, uh, Richard Lovell Edgeworth, you may remember, he brought up his first son, his oldest son, who was called Richard, on principles of Rousseau, which was a great mistake, and, and the boy was completely ungovernable and, 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 and couldn't be controlled by it. He, was, he was, wasn't given any education at all, because Rousseau suggested they should be, children should be allowed to run around with bare feet and not given any proper education until they were at least seven. Anyway, this was a total disaster. So anyway, in the end, poor Richard Edgeworth was packed off to Lord Longford's ship. So he was, his, I mean, but this lovely Ezra called to his friend and got him a place for his son, his oldest son, who was the older brother of Mariah, on his ship. And unfortunately, Richard, Richard Edgeworth almost immediately ran away, so, and then ended up in America. So that was the next, the next generation. Um, the third generation is the one we see up there. That's the second, well, he's third baron, second earl of Longford. He inherits in 1792. And he is really the one who transforms this house from being a, a kind of rather plain, squarish, which would be a 17th century plantation house to a first a Georgian house, and, and then becomes under this fellow there, under his influence, it becomes a Gothic castle. So there you see on the two sides of the, the, the flat bark bars, you see what it looked, what it was planned to look like in 1802 with the work of some architect called Francis Johnson. So Mariah Edgeworth's letters are absolutely fascinating for us because they describe all the different stages of Lord Longford transforming his house from being a really rather plain, uncomfortable house with, into, a, into, a, into a kind of, what she called a mansion fit for a nobleman of his rank. So I thought I'd read you again a bit about, about um, what she writes in 1809 when she comes here to stay. They were, used to come here about once or twice a year. They had to cross, as you know, this great bog, called, what she called a vast Serbonian bog. And they had to go across the river, um, river I, can't, well, I don't know what river it is anyway, they had to cross it on a ferry. So it was all very complicated. You had to put your coach on a ferry and then it had to be paddled over to the other side. There was no bridge between Edwards Town and Castle Pollard till about the 1830s. And it was built, in fact, by that land in conjunction with Richard Lovell Edgeworth's son. Um, anyway, so, so here she, she, he's describing the house in 1809, and, and Lord Longford has just finished turning it into a castle. So it says, Lord Longford has finished and furnished his castle, which is now really a mansion, fit for a nobleman of his fortune. The furniture is neither Gothic nor Chinese, nor gaudy nor frail, but substantially handsome and suitable in all its parts. The library is scarlet and black with some red Morocco cushion chairs and some this shape, very handsome. And you will see when you get to the drawing room, this, she draws a little picture of this chair. She says, plain black with white Medusa heads in front of back inside, very clear. I was desired to estimate these chairs and, oh, shameful chance, guess them at a guinea and a half when their price was nine guineas. So she <laughs> made a terrible bloomer there. The, the vents hall so well warmed that the children play in it from morn till night. Lord L seems to take great pleasure in repeating 20 times that he was to thank Mr. Edgeworth for this. The whole house and every bedchamber so thoroughly warmed, we never felt any reluctance from going upstairs and from one room to another. I hope you anticipate what I'm going to say, that now Lord L has made such a comfortable nest, he must certainly get some bird with pretty plumage and a sweet voice to fill it. So anyway, that's, that's the evidence we have for the fact that this 
room has got the kind of earliest central heating as far as we know of any private house in Ireland. There were certainly, the, I think the Houses of Parliament already had central heating. But anyway, this was put in probably about 18 or 4 or 5. And the, we think probably there were, there were two fireplaces originally to heat the hall. And when they took, put the heating in, you can see the grills all around the, all around the walls. Um, they were able to take one of the fireplaces away and put the organ in there. So he was an extraordinary man, Richard Double Edgeworth, as you probably all know, in terms of practical inventions. He did all kinds of things at Edgeworthstown, and he, um, we know he invented the telegraph system. He used to signal to his friend, Lord Longford, from the top of the hill opposite when he was trying out the telegraph system. And uh, he invented um, a sort of, sort of early version of the Caterpillar tractor and all kinds of... I don't know, have you, have you all read all about him in, in those books? Anyway, we he was. We still have to educate him over an Oh, time. I see, I see. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, he was, he, was, he was a very, very talented man in, in, in all kinds of ways. And he belonged to this thing called the Lunar Society, which was one of the founding members, members of the Lunar Society, which basically applied, was applying science to industry. And his speciality was designing carriage wheels and, and, and tracks for, for vehicles. And he went on right to the end of his life. I think he died having just published a book about carriage, carriage wheels and, and was always rushing up to the, to the um, Royal Society in Dublin to, to, to read out about his various experiments. But anyway, this is one of his experiments, was putting the central heating here. We're very grateful to him. Unfortunately, we can only afford to turn it on <laughs> <laughs> once every little moon. Because, of course, it originally would have been heated by turf, which came in. If you go into the garden, you can still see there's an entry of a tunnel in the pleasure ground and that's where we think they brought in great lorry, um, wagon loads of turf, and, the, and all the, they would have been burnt in the basement in a boiler there. And then there would have been a hot air system taking them all around the, all around the house. But it was very, if you think of what, um, well, 18th and 19th century houses were like, they obviously you could heat your bedroom by having a fire in it, um, but you couldn't heat your corridors. It was very, very difficult to think of ways of heating corridors. So this was unique in the sense that it had warm corridors, you could rush from one room to the other without feeling absolutely frozen. Can I, can I just say, uh, I'm that far from Edgerstown and uh, involved with the Edgerstown Society, and just to say that uh, he put in a system in Edgerstown as well, uh, he did, yeah, yeah, a central heating system in Edgerstown, and it involved, again, pumping water up the chimney, along the side of the chimney of yeah. the houses, of the house, the and, and then the fire heated the water, yeah. and um, uh, it, it extracted uh, fresh and warm yeah. air into yeah. the rooms. Yeah. But to get the water up to the very top of the house, uh, without electricity, he needed a pump. Uh, so he devised a pump, which is still known to this day as the Edgewood Money Pump, oh, really? right? And the pump was located out in the yard at Edgerstown House, mm. and <coughs> tenants or children or uh, whoever wanted to could come to the house, and after so many revolutions of the pump, it dispensed a coin. So he didn't have to supervise. Oh, very uh, clever. Yeah, very clever. Well, and you should try that on my work. You should try that on my work. No workers, that's right. So, uh, yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, there's a, the, uh, a, 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 some scholar wrote a book uh, or a, an article entitled uh, The Edge of Money Pump. Oh, that's so, yeah. yeah, and he installed that actually before he installed the central heating oh, system oh, here. Oh, so. Yes, mm. and I know he did all kinds of things. He had sort of leather hinges for doors. So that's they right. Were, and, um, and, and apparently, he, yeah, I mean, he obviously transformed Edward Sam from being a very uncomfortable um, old fashioned house into being a really lovely, comfortable house, didn't he? Yeah, anyway. You mentioned the doors. The, the idea of the doors was mm. where, where, where big doors slammed and yes. made a lot of noise. Yeah. And you'd see it very simple. You still, still see them in some houses. He just made a, a leather belt yeah. uh, that was connected to the, the door. So uh, it slowed the torsion of the door. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Anyway, I think he was a, he was a wonderful man. Um, and Mariah, absolutely, we all know, absolutely adored her father. But anyway, she, but she also was very... She, she, as we all know, she took over the Edwards and Stan estate after he died. She really had to run it because her brother, Lovell, proved complete hopefully hopeless. Well, he didn't start off, he, he set up this wonderful school, which was very innovative. But I think he, he'd been a prisoner of war in, in France for 12 years, and he had actually become a, a secret alcoholic. And so eventually, she, 
he had to be deposed and she did, took over all the management. So she kept on coming here and she, um, as I say, was very fond of, the, the, of him. He was about six years um, younger than her, but she, she, she loved his company and he would tell her stories of all kinds of highlights that she put in her novels and things like that. And um, I think, but anyway, she records really what happens again in, after he, 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 he finally gets married, the one up there, in 1816, when he's about 38, to someone called Georgina Ligon, who was the daughter of Lord Beecham. I don't know if you've heard of Madrasfield, which is the house which is meant to be the original of, um, oh, um, what's the famous book by Evelyn War? Um, what? Brideshead. Brideshead. Anyway, it's meant to be the original for Brideshead. It was where, anyway, the Lord Beecham, Lord Beecham, the descendants of this Lord Beecham, <coughs> were, 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 is the basis for the story in, in Brideshead. Um, anyway, so he marries Lord G Georgina Ligon, who was much younger than him, and they have lots of children. And um, but they, she is rah, doesn't really like her. She says she's rather cold-hearted and not very warm, and, and sort of slightly kind of critical of her. But she comes mm -hmm. here again in um, about 1826, and um, and she completely changes her view because she says that Lord Lady Love and Georgina has made these amazing gardens here. She describes the gardens in great detail. She says the most beautiful gardens she's ever seen in England or Ireland. I think she was probably exaggerating a bit. But a lot of the gardens, I don't know if you've had time to go around the gardens yet, oh, um, a lot of them are really layout is really due to the, that, that Lady Longford, Georgina Ligon. And unfortunately for her, her husband died when he was 61 and she was left aged from like 30, 32 with eight small children. And she didn't really live here much after her husband died. But he had left, not only had he transformed the original house into a Gothic <coughs> mansion, um, but he'd also left plans. He was obsessed with building. He, he loved building. He'd also left plans for the wings you may have noticed that, that, that the, these huge grey wings which stick out at the back of the, the, the original house, and they had also been, that was also part of, of his plans, and they were carried through by his, by his son in about the 1840s. So really, all the building work was really, uh, was really undertaken by, by the second Lord Longford. He was the only approach to an East seat, I think, has ever been here. After that, they, they just... <laughs> <laughs> he lived very quietly and didn't buy anything. Um, anyway, the other thing I quickly thought, as you know, probably, um, Mara lived to be um, 83 or 4, and I think, I think it was 83. But anyway, she died in 1849, and so she'd lived through the famine, the Great Famine. And I thought you might like just to see these pictures. She, she herself was very old by then. She couldn't really do much to help, but she wrote a story to raise money, her last story, it's called Orlandino, and that's a picture of her in 1847. This is from a, 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 an album in the National Library, and, and I, I, the best, we've done our best to blow it up for you, but it, you can see there she is as an old, old lady um, writing at her desk um, to raise money for the famine, and she also wrote off to the Quakers and got them to send... Um, well, she said the main thing, what they wanted, was that the, all these poor people who were being paid to work in those relief works, but they had no shoes, and so it was sort of awful for them. So she said what they needed most were, 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 was leather to make shoes with. So she arranged for, to get from the Quakers to send her um, a huge amounts of leather, and these were made by a local... Um, what, 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 not a blacksmith, a shoe smith. Oh, right. Anyway, it, it made into shoes for them. So there are the barefooted peasants of Edgeworthstown in without their shoes on, queuing up, no doubt, for meal and also for clothing. And again... Not much has changed. Not much has changed. <laughs> <laughs> but but um, anyway, but she was, she was very much... Um, she, she, she was believed very much, you know, that you had to help yourself. She didn't believe in people begging. But she changed her mind completely during the family. She said it was ridiculous to say that people could work to support themselves. That when they were absolutely starving and they had, how could they possibly support themselves by working on relief works? And she also was very critical of the fact that all the local fields were not being tilled because everybody was on relief works. And so instead of growing crops in the field, they were all being, they, they couldn't afford not to be on the relief work, so there was nothing being cultivated. So it's really very fascinating her, her, her views of how the, of, of the English 
mismanagement of the famine. And if we ever have time to read uh, biographies of her, or can read the letters when mine come out, you can see, uh, see all her views. But she, she was a very old lady by then. It was really the person who, who got the um, Edgeworth Town through the famine without too much disasters was the local clergyman who was called Mr. Powell, who seems to be an admirable man, and Mrs. Powell, and her stepmother, who was also her great friend, who was her father, as you may go, married four times, and his last wife, who was called Beaufort, was about two years younger than Moran. They became huge friends, and, 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 and Mrs. Edgeworth, the last Mrs. Edgeworth, survived, she lived to be 95, so she only died in about 1865, I think. So, but anyway, she, she was really, the, she and the Poles were the ones who really got Edgeworth Stone through the famine, but with help, we are using her name and fame to get supplies from the Quakers, and they had, I think, huge soup boilers and things like that as well. But as far as I know, I mean, there weren't, obviously there were deaths from fever, but I didn't think there were actual deaths from starvation in the Edgeworth Stone area, were there? Uh, there were some, yeah. Uh, she, she recites in one of her letters where Mr. Chute, and yes. Mr. Chute keeps coming up in her letters because That's right, yeah, uh, yeah. she was married into the Chute family. Or yeah, they, they they family were married, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah but she recites where Mr. Chute came and he, he, she was inquiring what conditions were like in Edgbaston. And, and uh, he says that he had, he had passed a, a woman walking down the, the street uh, with a baby uh, wrapped around across her neck. Yeah. Uh, little did she know that the child was, was dead. Actually dead. dead. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. she she, yeah. she relays that in a letter yeah. to yeah. Yeah. Uh, her yeah. aunt, Mrs. Yeah. Ruxton. I think it wasn't as I mean it was obviously. But it wasn't much, as bad as the west of Ireland. In the west of Ireland, that's in the southwest of Ireland. Those were the really terrible places. But um, anyway, but they, they were, I mean, they, I think they, all, I mean, there were endless famines right the way through the 1820s. There were, so she was, there was, she was really, in a way, she was sort of used to famine. I mean, she, they, they lived through so many minor famines that I don't think she realized until about 1846 or 7, her brother, who'd been managing the state, also died, Francis Edgeworth. Mm. And she was, I, mean, I think they had two or three deaths in the family. So they were, she was being hit by her brothers and sisters dying. And so that... In a way that you know, she, her mind was not necessarily entirely on, on the people of Edgeworth Town. Um, anyway, I think that's really enough. Anyone want to ask any questions about anything? We can, we can, we can walk and talk back. Well, yeah. Well, we well when you get into the dining room, I'll just point out some of the other people who the Edgeworths um, who Mara mentions in her. In her. And just, just to say, just to say, for all the people that haven't been. They, the, these are all people that are here on the group uh, and may not know about Edgerstown, but we have Richard Edgeworth that was reared here. His portrait is in Edgerstown, and all the family portraits are in Edgerstown. Oh, yes, 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 yes. But of course, here's a picture. These are Richard Lovelace's memoirs, and, the, and actually they've got a picture of Lord, of, of Lord Longford. Not that one, this one here. There's a picture of the second Lord Longford in the, who's the frontispiece of Richard Lovell Edwards. So they were huge friends and, and, and also relations. But You're dining with your ancestors. That's why we're going to talk about the people on the wall. So I always remind you where you came from when you're having your dinner in here. Now, the, dinner, the dining room here is also designed to impress the guests that come here. So the centerpiece there is made, uh, is made by Fusion, the uh, designer. Also the wallpaper. The wallpaper here is designed by Fusion, the same wallpaper that's in the House of Lords in England. Isn't that very impressive? Yes. There's a better story about the wallpaper, right? It was given to Thomas and Valerie as a wedding present, and Valerie hated it and said, there's no way that's going up, right? <laughs> so it was put into a press, and if Thomas is telling you the story, he'd say, he'd say, 10 years later, Valerie opened the press, and go, oh my God, look at the lovely wallpaper, let's put that up. <laughs> but that's not necessarily the truth, right? So I said to Valerie, I said, is that what happens? She goes, no, he lied. He said that if he put up that wallpaper, he painted everything white here. She said, dining here, it felt like you were underneath a giant crap. Mm -hmm. So they decided to put the wallpaper up to see if it released it. But that's where that comes from. This lady in the room here is Lady Elizabeth Cuff on the right-hand side there. She's the lady that brings the love of literacy, the money, and the title into the family. And also, as we said, it was her uncle, the rector, that had the rights to a small fishing village. And that's where the money comes from. So advantageous marriage, as all the gentlemen in this room will understand, is how you proceed in life. So the small fishing village she had um, the rights to was Dunleary. 
Uh -huh. And as John Leary got bigger and bigger, the house here. So when Thomas became uh, the Earl here in 1961, he also got the title Baron Silchester. So Silchester Terrace up in Don Leary, that's all to do with the Longfords, only the grand grand up there, and, all, and the Packenham family. So Thomas Packenham, first Earl here, the lucky gentleman that marries Elizabeth Cup. So this is this. The second Earl here is Thomas. Right, this gentleman who you see out there, he's the contemporary with Marie Edgewood here. He's the gentleman that turned down uh, Arthur Wolseley for his second marriage proposal. And then this is his father, Edward here. He was the one who turned Arthur down the first time. Now we get to the third Earl down here. He looks very good in his bright uniform and everything else. And Thomas uh, fondly remembers him as the chocolate soldier. Never went to war. Died in mysterious circumstances in a North London hotel. That's the main, this lady here, Georgina Ligon, she's the wife of the second Earl over there, and she's the one that Member Valerie made reference to that she didn't like her because uh, Maria Edwards was always trying to match make for Thomas, always introducing him to one of her friends and stuff and everything else. Then he went off and did his own thing at a very late age in life and married someone that she actually didn't know. So it was a little bit of a snub with all her matchmaking attempts. So Georgie did land on responsible for the gardens around here, and she did come around during the end because she made such a good uh, job on the garden, which was said to her like a fairy land. Now, here we are in the drawing room. Right, we're after leaving the dining room, and that's the correct way to come from one room to the other room, because in Georgian times, the lords and ladies will dine together in the drawing room, and then towards the end of the meal, the ladies will withdraw from that room because the men want to talk about important matters that the ladies won't understand, and you don't want to contradict your husband over things that you're ignorant about. So you will come down to this drawing room here where he gets his name from, and you talk about things that you do know about, like needlework and embroidery. You know gossiping or anything going around, right? But what does happen up there in the dining room is that cigars come out, so you start to smoke, get smoky. Brandy and port is going in, so it's getting loud, right? And then the footman lets them relieve themselves in the room with the chamber pot. So when Valerie came here the first time, when you come here and you look around your house the first time, she found there's a secret panel cupboard in the dining room, and she opened it up and there's 20 chamber pots in it. Now, in this room, we have a beautiful view down over the terrace. That, this is the original facade of the house that I showed you with that old picture, the sketch. And straight down over the terraces, that's where the French gardens was with the waterworks and stuff and everything down there. Now, the flower gardens, as you see when you go out, are over to the right-hand side. And they're away from the house, so it's a little bit unusual. But if they're away from the house for a particular reason, right? Because out the window here, there is a hill, right? And it's called Knock Iron. You can just see it there behind that fir tree, right? And that on Knock Iron, that was the local gallows. So when you're sitting in your flower garden and there's somebody dangling on the gallows, it's very off-putting. So you want to move your garden away from where the gallows are. The last picture we're going to show you here, this little boy on the dog. And the little boy looked dressed like a girl, because at that time, they dress all the children like girls, because the fairy might come and steal the boy child, because they're the valuable one. So they don't understand what cop that is or sudden infant death. So the best way you can do that is to disguise. And you see the royals today, they do the same thing. The young prince had long hair and was wearing a dress in tradition because that's the way of making sure that if the angel of death comes in that the kids or the it'll only be looking for the male child so those were a little dress he grew up his name was um, edward he grew up he was a soldier in uh, well wellington army and then he said to wellington he goes i'm giving up being a soldier i'm going to become a monk and the duke said well you're a damn fine soldier so you make a damn fine monk and then he went and became a catholic and he founded Mount Argus Passionist Fathers in Dublin. And Thomas is quite hopeful that he might be on the way to sainthood. Because it's all right to have admirals and generals in the family, but if you have a live living saint, he could do a lot more for you. You could get him to do things. So Thomas wants to keep everything open there. Now, here we have a coronet, the crown. Look, crown's base, just like the sunshine, when the sun breaks the hill, breaks the horizon. That's oh, God's rulers on earth wear crowns. And this crown was used at the coronation of King George V. And this is the Lord's crown, the Lady's crown. When you're at a coronation, it goes on forever because they're very, very important. So you keep your sandwiches underneath your coronet so you don't pass out from the hunger. Now, obviously, the lady is going to be on a, a smaller diet than the gentleman, right? But that's for, that's what, so when you're at your next coronation and you're invited, and remember, the lords and ladies only put their crown on after the king is crowned because they have to show their servitude to him.
No, we're all here. So we're down here in the Victorian kitchen. And this is the height of technology in the 1840s, 1860s, that period. Because it's a model kitchen. Everything you need to run a big castle is in this kitchen, right? And also the servants have been treated much better now than in Georgian times. Georgian times, the servants are down below the house, stuck in the basement. All the work with the ovens and the fires are heating the house, and you're keeping them out of the way. So there's a tunnel here in the gardens from Georgian times that goes from where the vegetable garden was, right across the front windows of the drawing room, so that if we were in the drawing room, the last thing we need is to look out at the bloody serpent on the lawn. Right. <laughs> out of the way, right? So you know Downtown Abbey, right? Anybody watch Downtown Abbey? Yes. It's crap, isn't it? That's not how the servants and the lords and the no, 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 no. That's not what happens, right? One of the other houses that I do tour in, and it's got a very good example of it, is Lissadell House. And they had that house was built 1830, the late Georgian model, right? In the dining room, they don't have a serving mirror in that dining room there. Serving mirror is where the butler stands, with his back to everybody else, looking constantly into the mirror, waiting for a signal that he can come and attend to the table and then go back to his position with his back. Not to talk or interact or overhear what the lords and ladies are at. So that's the level of the interaction with, this, with the servants and uh, gentry. But here, you're trusting your servants far more now in Victorian times. You're giving them your, their own quarters above the ground, and unusually for the kitchen, a beautiful view out the window. Also, it's not the servant doing no work, just standing looking out the window all day, right? So within here, the, the uh, machines that we have here, there's a big uh, turntable here. This does not belong in the kitchen. It belongs in the dairy, and it's for making buttermilk. Oh, so you put your butter on that, and you wash water on it, put it through the mangle, and what you're taking off that is your buttermilk. So they're very, very self-sufficient in all these big houses to have their kitchen garden, they're doing their preserves, they're doing their bakery, uh, and here you have the engine of the whole kitchen here, this big range. And everywhere you have something hot, which are all sprayed, you put the water tank inside it, so you always have access to hot and boiling water. Over there underneath that window, it's what you would call a bambari today, right? It's a hot holder, and it's done by the water pipes coming from the back of this. So when you're serving, if you're serving a meal for 40 or 50 or 60 people in the castle, you have to be able to keep your food hot before you get it up to corridor. Because I was talking to a lady there about how did they ever get the food from here and keep it warm up to there. So when Thomas and Valerie came here in 1961, all the servants left. They knew they had no money. So they lived in this kitchen, used the kitchen for two years, and then worked out that's not how you do it. Because every time you get up there, your food is frozen. So then they moved the kitchen up right in behind the dining room where it is today, and then it's ease of access. But one day in the cellar, Thomas met this man down in the basement, and he said to him, who are you? And the man goes, uh, who are you first? He goes, and he goes, I'm the new lord. And he goes, I didn't know they had changed. He goes, I'm your, I'm your boiler man. I don't think he'd been above ground in a couple of years. <laughs> he was down there stoking the boilers uh, down in the basement. This is an original footman's jacket from Victorian times. Already been through service, still in existence, made in Mullingar has the crest of Longford's crown on the buttons. This is what the footmen would have worn around here. Now, we do little spooky walks here at Halloween and we have mysterious butlers and things, but it has to be my 12-year-old son that wears this jacket because it's too small. I can't fit into it. So people much smaller at that time, particularly the servants, because they're always on the go. And remember that they're born into generally poorer families with large amounts, large amounts of amounts of feed. So the nutrition you get for the first three months of your life determines where you're going to end up in your potential. So these people are much, much smaller than we are now, but fantastic to have the original uh, coat still here in the castle. Again, the servants, the only thing they know is the class system. So the class system between the servants and the gentry. So the servants have their own class system. So this is 1909, and the maid here, the maid has a great name. Her name is Miss Reason. Right? I'd hire her maid for a reason. Right? So she's here and she's serving 11 teas, the hierarchy of teas. So you serve the gentry first and then you go down through their children. And you end up here with the stable man, the riding master. Nobody knows what he wants, so he's sitting on his own in the stables. And he says, about the stable man, he goes, it's a room too grand for the servants, but not grand enough for the gentry. So obviously he has ideas about the station. So that'll give you an idea of what it was like to work here, trying to serve all these teas to the right people. Now what would happen if the order was got wrong for those teas on one single <coughs> afternoon? The world would end. That's what civilization would be gone if that tea order wasn't done correctly. So that's <laughs>
from. This is an industrial laundry. You would have heard laundries obviously in the news and for different areas about industrial laundries. So this is actually a working model for one that was installed here in the castle. I remember we're going to show you when we go to the last room out there, the ironing room, the plans of the castle. So all these rooms were built for this purpose. It's not that this was something else and the purpose was changed and then they moved the laundry in here. So these are all purpose built. So at home, when you have your laundry machine, this is the men's favorite room, as we said, they're gonna learn how to do some washing, right? At home, you press the button and your tub goes randy, 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 and everything is done and it's finished. It might dry it for you too as well, and you can go and do something else when this is happening. In Victorian times, this is the tub, and it's built in here with a furnace underneath it. That's not going to go randy, randy, randy. So the maid comes up here, and she goes randy, randy, randy. And she's got a big paddle, and that's what's putting the laundry around with the detergent, and that's the action that needs to be done to wash the clothes. So when they come out of the tub, they go over here to the wooden sinks, and these are the rinsing sinks. So the detergent is rinsed off of there, and then everybody knows what a mangle is, because even the early electric ones, so all came with the mangle on top. So you use the mangle to get the water out of it. And then at the very back there, Victorian's very good at inventions, a box mangle, right? For ironing a sheet full or a tablecloth full, you put it through that, you put stones on the top of it to increase the weight, and then you crank the big handle. All these maids are very fit here. There's no gyms at Victorian times. <laughs> One of them, in fact, would have a huge right arm if you're up here all the time. You have to keep rotating, right? But they used to say about the maids here, that they were eating their heads off. Now that sounds worse than it is, right? It just means they're not doing enough work. There's only 100 rooms in the castle and they only have to do the linen for all of the family. So they came up with a solution during hunt season. From England, put it in panniers, put it on a train, on a boat, on a train, on another train, and imagine the joy in here when the cart comes into the yard. Woofie! Here's the Oxford Union hunt here again, already in, in traveling for maybe five or six days with grass stains, blood, and muck on it, and you have to wash it, get all that out, press it, and get it back on time again. Not really economic sense, but it's just showing that the largesse. I have an industrial laundry in my country pile in Ireland. I will get my girls to do it, my mates will do the hunt. So, not a good idea to be doing that. Here you have again the little children's clothing from the Victorian times. Remember we said they dress everybody as a little girl in case the angel or the fairy comes and takes them on you in the middle of the night. And then you dress them in the little Victorian boys' suit. See it there, the little shorts? The Victorian times, the English Navy, Britannia rules the waves. So that time, all the little, it was very popular for the little guys to come out in their little sailor suits. When they were going to the bleaching green, right, because the sunlight bleaches the linen, right? So they had the little tunnel here, right? Because remember, you're responsible for the, the, the moral behavior of your servants, too. Mm -hmm. You know, so uh, well, you don't want to have female servants and you have male servants, right. and you just want to make sure that the mix is correct and the mixing in the right circles. The right circle. It's having your own children, right? Let's see where they are, right? So instead of the bleaching green, it's when you leave the tea rooms and you go back to the car park, you'll see it on the right-hand side. It's just a little small, like a little wall garden, but it's a sun trap, and that's what takes the sun. And you know the expression, you don't air your dirty linen in public? Yeah. That's because you put it in the bleaching green, so nobody can see it, right? <laughs> so instead of the maids having to go the closest way to the bleaching green, it's going through that outer courtyard, but you'd have to go by the stable lads, and they might be chatting and making arrangements. So the better thing to do is to keep them under the ground. When in doubt, put everybody under the ground. I mean, that, right? Under the ground, and out to the beach and green, and back again. And no idle chatter. Water comes from one of the spring wells that's around here. So it shows you the servants' hall, the beer cellar, the boot room, the butler's pantry. Every room has a functionality built into it. In the abattoir room, there's a drain for the blood to flow out of. So that it shows you everything, every room has a purpose. And here as well, what do servants get paid? 
So you, you do get paid. It's not that there's an indentured labor. And you get, you, here was a, a working farm. So you got eggs and you got milk and you got bread and everything delivered to your house daily. And you get paid here, say, somebody, a stable boy here, six pounds to 12 pounds a year, depending on your experience. Now, as we said, it goes up there, the, um, the gamekeeper, was game, head gamekeeper, 100 pounds to 150 pounds. Why does he get paid so much? Because it's in a position of trust. If you could start making money on the side, with the game and with poachers taking brides. So you have to pay him well to keep everything fine for you. Same the coachman has to get paid well 70 pounds a year. Now in 1860, what is a pound worth? It's worth today 40 pounds, right? And we have to do it on a yearly basis because in 1798, a pound is worth 100 pounds today because values of currency fluctuate. You know, like with Brexit or with war, time of war is good for farmers, particularly in the Napoleonic Wars, because all the land prices are going up because horses run on grain. So that's how you need, you grow your crops and it goes straight into the armed forces and they have to pay their bills. Okay, folks, that's the end of your tour. I hope you enjoyed it. And yeah. um, we're going to bring you outside now to get a little bit of colour back in your cheeks. <laughs> <laughs> After we out of the sun. Yeah. 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 Yeah.